All right, we've been in a series going through the book of Luke, and it's called Luke, The Orderly Account of Truth. And we've been in this series for like almost a year and a half now. It's been awesome. Yeah, it's great. Woohoo! I promise we're going to be doing some breaks here and there in the series eventually, but we're going to finish the book of Luke because it's been amazing. But Luke investigated and wrote an orderly account of everything that happened when Jesus walked the earth. And the purpose he did that was what he says is for Theophilus, but we also get the same benefit that Theophilus got, right? We get to know the exact truth about who Jesus is and what he taught. That's what's happening in the book of Luke. And last week, Pastor Jordan showed us how quickly our own priorities can get out of alignment. We know that to be true, right? Our own own priorities can get out of whack in a split second. And when that happens, when our focus shifts to the cares of the world or the anxieties of life rather than on God, then everything else in our life starts to fall apart. I say it's like trying to walk with your spine out of alignment. You just, it just doesn't work. Things just don't work the way they're supposed to. When our priorities are out of the order that God has set, nothing works the way it's supposed to. It's only when Jesus is central to everything in our lives and that we follow, that we're following God's proper order and things operate the way God intended. And we learned last week that Mary understood that Jesus is the better thing to focus on. That he is the one thing that can't be and won't be taken away, right? We saw that from what Pastor Jordan was preaching last week. This week, we're going to be starting in in Luke chapter 11. So you guys can start turning turning there. If you don't have a Bible, uh, run out there to the resource desk. We have Bibles sitting on there. We want you to take that and keep it if you don't have one. We're going to be in Luke chapter 11, and it's going to start with Jesus reminding his disciples about the proper priority of things, even when we're praying. It's not just things to be concerned about or cared about or worried about, but even when we pray, there's a proper priority order. And one of Jesus' disciples asks him to teach him how to pray. So Jesus tells him the kinds of things to pray for. He prays a shorter version of what we call the Lord's Prayer. But after telling them what kinds of things to pray for, he tells them how they should pray, or what I say is the posture they should take when they pray. And then Jesus wraps it all up by reminding the disciples that God is a good father and he will answer his children. So the the title of today's message is this, God answers his children. God answers his children. He does. We see it all throughout scripture. If you've read any bit of the Old Testament, you've seen how the children of Israel were constantly crying out to God and he was answering them. They would get themselves into trouble by forgetting who God was and turning to false idols. And then they'd come crying to God to save them. And you know what? He did. But before you start thinking like, hey, these Israelites, they screwed it up, but we're so much better than they are. Before you start thinking that we're any better, think about how many times you've cried out to God for something. And some of those times, just like the Israelites, it was our own fault that we were in that situation. It was our own decisions and choices that put us in that, in that position. Not all of the situations are like that. Some of them are out, outside of our control, but some of them are our, our fault. But even in those situations, the Lord still heard you. He heard, and because he hears you, and because he hears his children, he answers them. He hears the cries of his children, and he responds You guys ready to read through the text? All right, we're going to see what Jesus is teaching his disciples and what he's teaching us today, because it's the same message. It's not different. He's teaching us what to pray for, how we should pray, and that God will answer. So Luke chapter 11, we're going to be in verses 1 through 13. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray... Say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey, uh, excuse me, a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, 
Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? It's a big chunk of text. But do you guys see what Jesus is talking about and teaching here? I mean, we're going to break it down. So in case you didn't, we're still going to dive into all of it. But the big idea that, that I want to, that I think the text is arguing and that I would like to argue today, and if you're taking notes, write this down. It's that God gives his children what they truly need. So pray persistently and boldly. God gives his children what they truly need. So pray persistently and boldly. We can pray with boldness and persistent tenacity as God's children because we know that he will answer his children and he will give us what we truly need. Caleb, can you keep your baby quiet? I'm totally joking. <laughs> That's a miracle baby over there and I'm so excited about it. Raise your hand if you have kids. Look, this leads perfectly into our, uh, our illustration here. Even if you don't have kids, you've heard a kid who's just nagging their parents for something, right? You're walking through the grocery store, can I have a candy bar? 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 Or my personal favorite, please, 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 over and over and over again. There is zero shame when it comes to a child asking their parents for something, right? There's no shame. They don't have any shame. There's only persistence and shameless audacity. They're not embarrassed to ask. They don't care if you're busy or not, right? They have no clue if it fits in the budget. They don't care if it's a healthy decision for them or not. They don't even care if it'll make them sick. They just want whatever it is. That's just kids for you. They're, and they're going to keep asking for it. Low key, I kind of feel like this is how Jesus is telling us to be with God the Father in the text. So I want us to go back and look and see. Let's see if that's, uh, let's see if that's what's, uh, what Jesus is saying. Let's look at the first verse. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Jesus was praying. This is something he would regularly do. You read scripture, any of the gospels, you will see Jesus is regularly praying. We read back in Luke 5, 16, that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Or if you look at Matthew 14, 23, after sending the disciples on ahead, ahead of him, he went up on a mountainside to pray by himself. Or again in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Jesus gets up super early in the morning and goes off into a solitary place to pray. Jesus regularly would be in prayer, constantly be in prayer. So the first thing I think we need to understand from this, the, from the very beginning of this, of this passage here, is this. Christians are a praying people. Christians are a praying people. We pray. That's what we do. The word Christian literally means to be Christ-like. Whose example are we following? Jesus. Whose model are we following? Jesus. We do what Jesus did. We are to imitate him, follow that model. And you know what? He prayed and he prayed a lot. Jesus prayed, so we should pray too. Well, how much should we pray? First Thessalonians 5 tells us we should pray without ceasing. <laughs> yeah, like constant. Always be in prayer, in constant connection, and communication with God the Father. Always be in prayer. So Jesus, doing what he does all the time, praying to God the Father, gets approached by one of his disciples here. Can we put that verse back up there? Verse number one. When he finished praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So on this occasion, his, one of these disciples, at least one of the disciples, probably more, was able to see or hear Jesus when he's praying. And after seeing him, he was driven to ask Jesus to teach them. He said, teach us disciples to pray. And I wonder, what did he see or what did he hear that would have him so intrigued? He's like, Jesus, teach us to do what you just did. What did he see? 
Bible doesn't give us that answer, but it's fun to speculate. But they said, or he said, teach us as John taught his disciples. And that's John the Baptist he's talking about. The one who was sent before Jesus to prepare the way for him. And in the same way that John taught his disciples, the followers, these followers of Jesus wanted him to teach them. So let's look at what Jesus taught them. Let's go to verse, uh, verses two through four. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. This disciple wasn't asking, like, what specific words should I say to pray? And that's not what Jesus was answering him. Jesus was not telling them, only say these words in this succession. That's not what was going on here. Is there anything wrong with reciting the Lord's Prayer? Absolutely not. There's nothing wrong with reciting the Lord's prayer. It's actually a safe bet if you don't know what to say. I would say pray it. But what we need to do is we need to be mindful that it doesn't turn into mindless recitation. Where our minds are now disengaged and we're just praying these heartless prayers of repetition. Things that don't actually come from the heart. What's that uh, dinner prayer? Good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. It's quick when you're hungry and it works. But if you say that every single day, does it start to lose its meaning? Do you stop, and con- to stop to consider what you're actually saying? Isaiah prophesied the words of God when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The people would say the right things, but their hearts just weren't in it. And Jesse and I, we talked to our boys about this basically every single night at bedtime prayers. Everyone takes their turn praying, and I remind them, I say, don't say the same thing you say every night. Pray from the heart. I want you to pray from the heart. Don't just rush through something mindlessly. I want you to actually think about what you're saying, because you're praying to God, the creator of the universe, and guess what? He's listening. He wants to hear what you have to say, so he's actually listening. I mean, do you find yourself repeating the same prayers every day at some point? I, I definitely find myself repeating some of those prayers sometimes. So this isn't just a challenge for my boys. This is a challenge for me. So it's fine to say the Lord's Prayer, but I want us to stop and consider what we're saying and mean it. We need to mean it. Jesus isn't teaching here that we should mindlessly and heartlessly repeat words. But what he was teaching was the kinds of things to pray for. And the first thing he says is, Father, hallowed be your name. So what this tells us is he's speaking to the children of God. He's, he's speaking to the people of Israel. And just to bring it to our current context, he's speaking, he would be speaking to Christians too, right? Or believers. So what he's saying right here is this is a, a prayer for believers or followers of Jesus. Well, he's Jesus, so be followers of God. But this is a prayer for believers, The prayer for unbelievers would be what the tax collector said in Luke 18. He said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the prayer of the unbeliever, not our father, because the unbeliever is not his father yet. To be adopted into the the family is one who is a believer. So this prayer that Jesus is talking about, the things to pray for, he's speaking to people who are followers of God, to the children of God. But I love the contrast that he starts with here. Um, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you saw it or if it just was hitting me in the face, but the contrast be, between f- the word Father and the word hallowed. I think there's a huge contrast between these words. He's showing the two sides of our interaction that we have with God the Father. The first is he's our Father, which means we can have an intimate personal relationship with him, a very close relationship with him. He's a loving Father. He cares for us. He provides for us. He protects us, he teaches us, he blesses us, he lifts us up when we fall down and scrape our knees. He is everything that a perfect loving father is. That's who God the Father is, that's one side. The other side is that his name is hallowed. His name is, oh, so what does hallowed mean? It means holy, to be honored, shown great respect, to be revered. When he speaks, you listen. 
you obey his commands. You seek out his plans for things rather than ours. You do the things that make him proud. You speak well of him to others. He is holy to be revered. These are the two sides that I see, this this contrast of how we interact with God. He's our father, so we can have this intimate, personal, awesome relationship with him, but he's also holy, sovereign, and all-powerful. It's both at the same time perfectly. To love and to respect, to worship and to fear, to stand in pure adoration and to revere. I rhymed. That was cool. I didn't mean to do that. That's who we are praying to. That's who God the Father is. And it's after that, after understanding who it is we're praying to, that Jesus switches and tells us what to pray for. We acknowledge who God is, and then we pray that, verse 2, your kingdom come. That's what we're praying for. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Sometimes people just skip right over verse 2 and go straight to verse 3 as the first request. That's not the first request in this verse. The first request is your kingdom come. That is the very first thing that's being asked for. Whose kingdom? His. God's kingdom, not our kingdom. We're asking for God's kingdom to come. But what does it mean to pray that God's kingdom would come, that your kingdom would come? means to pray that his rule, his reign, his plans, his purposes, his will, his desires would all be fulfilled. That's what praying that his kingdom would come would be, that all those things would be fulfilled. And I think of, uh, like if you've read or think about any fantasy era story with a king in it that you've ever seen a movie about, read about, or whatever, or listened to a podcast about, there we go. Think about any of those situations. It's long live the king every time, no matter what happens, right? We're all in the court. The king's sitting on the throne. He's like, I don't like your face. Off with your head. What does everyone say? Long live the king. Hope you like my face, right? Long live the king. What you say goes. The whole kingdom lives to honor the king's headship. We ignore, I mean, God's not just lopping off heads, by the way. I don't mean to make it sound like that. But we acknowledge God's lordship in our lives. And a way that we do that is we submit to and pray that his will and his kingdom would come always. But I want you to really stop for a second and think about it. Stop and like really evaluate like what are the things you're asking God for? Whose kingdom and will are they most concerned with? Are you more concerned with asking for things for your kingdom or for God's kingdom? Does what I want supersede what God wants? Do my desires supersede God's desires? And we should be actively praying for his kingdom and will to come. That his plans would come to fulfillment over ours. Before asking God for anything else in our lives, our greatest desire as his children should be for his will to be done here on earth. That his kingdom would come. That's what must supersede all of my prayers. That's the first thing Jesus lists out here. The first request before any other request is made of God is that his kingdom would come. But why? Well, It's because his will is perfect. His plans are perfect. But I think most importantly, it's because he's God. He is king. He's the king. And our desires should match our kings. Our desires should match our fathers. Once we recognize who God is, we should submit to his will in all things. And after praying for that, this is when Jesus shifts over and starts to talk about our needs. And this is what I meant when I was saying that Jesus is kind of correcting our priority order, even in our prayers. But let's look at verses three and four. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And I see kind of two major categories here. I see our practical needs being prayed for and our spiritual needs being prayed for. 
give us each day is speaking to the practical daily needs that we have. We're humans. We need stuff to live and be alive, right? Jesus is telling us to ask the Father for these things. And it's not like God doesn't know what we need. He created us. He created the human body. So he knows exactly what we need. He knows how the body works. But look at the end of, of Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 31 through 34. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these, all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And verse 34 is a message in and of itself that we don't have time to preach today. But he knows that we need air and food and water and shelter. He knows that. God the Father knows that. He knows it before we even ask for those things. And Jordan and I actually were talking about it this past week. Um, that if God already knows what we need before we pray, then why do we need to pray at all? I mean, it's a valid question. Why do we need to pray if God already knows? God is omniscient or all-knowing. That means he literally knows everything. He knows all. And he brings his will to pass by his own means. So why would we pray and ask him then? Well, simply put, because he tells us to. He tells us to ask. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. You see a, a theme here about not being anxious or not worrying? We need to be told that a lot. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Ask him. Ask God for what you need. We're being told right here to ask God for what we need, even though he knows what we need before he asks, before we ask. He still wants us to come and ask him, to continually rely on him for everything, to rely on him for everything that we need. As a child comes to their parents for the things they need, we should come to God for the things we need. We know that our kids need to eat to live. We know that, but they still come and ask for food when they're hungry. We come to God daily for our needs. That's why it says, give us each day our daily bread. It doesn't say weekly. It doesn't say monthly. It doesn't say twice a year on Christmas Eve and Easter. Daily. Every day. It's a constant state of reliance and need on God the Father. And I love how Proverbs 30 puts it. This is, I forget this is in the Bible sometimes, so when I rediscover it, I'm like, oh yeah, this is so good. Two things I ask of you, Lord, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. I love those verses. Only give me what I need for today. Not too much, lest I forget you and think I'm good on my own. I don't need God. But not too little, lest I sin out of desperation. Give me just enough that I keep coming back to the source of my provision. And that's God. That is God, our Father. Right? This is these practical needs. But it's not, we're not only asking God for the practical needs. We're also going to ask him for our spiritual needs, too. Look at verse 4 again. Verse 4 starts with, Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. The only way to receive forgiveness is through faith in Jesus. That's the only way to receive forgiveness from God, is through faith or belief in Jesus. He's Jehovah Jireh. That's who God is. He's our provider. Not just for our physical needs, but he provided for our spiritual needs here. God is the one who set up the whole plan to make it happen. We go to God, our Father, for forgiveness. Nowhere else. The reason we go to him is because he's the one that we've transgressed against. Our transgressions are against him. He's the one we've sinned against. David understood this after he slept with a married woman, got her pregnant, and had her husband killed. 
David understood this because after he did all that, he wrote Psalm 51. Well, he got called out by the prophet Nathan first, but he wrote Psalm 51. And he said in Psalm 51, he says, against you, you only have I sinned. I'm like, wait a minute, you only? Dude, you sinned against Bathsheba, Uriah, your entire country that you were a king over? You sinned against a lot of other people, but what did David say? Against you, you alone have I sinned. David understood that any time that we sin, we're sinning against God. It's his laws that we broke. If God tells me to love my wife a certain way and I don't love her the way I should, whose law did I break? Not hers. I broke God's, way worse. Now I'm gonna have to put up with the wrath of my wife as well. But it's God's laws that I broke. He's the one we've sinned against. He's the one who set the standard for all of mankind to live by. The only one who can forgive a debt is the one that the sin, or the debt is owed to, the one the sin is against. And our debt of sin is owed to God. That's why we go to him for forgiveness. And he provided the only way, amen? But verse four continues, and it makes a wild assumption. Look at that, verse four. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. It doesn't say we should. What does that say? For we also forgive. We do it. This is an assumptive part of the sentence. Forgive us our sins, the request. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. That is just an assumptive fact that's being said here. It's an assumption that the children of God would forgive others, that Christians forgive. But why is that assumed? Why is it assumed that Christians would forgive? Because if there's anybody on this earth who understands forgiveness, it's Christians. We've been saved by grace through faith, not by works. There is nothing we could have ever done to deserve forgiveness. It's a free gift of God. The Lord has freely given it to us as a gift. Therefore, how could we ever withhold forgiveness of another? How could we ever withhold forgiveness? But they didn't deserve it. Neither did you. Neither did I. But they didn't apologize. They didn't ask for forgiveness. Well, before God revealed who Jesus is, you hated God and you would never ask, you would never apologize. You would never ask for forgiveness. But they might hurt me again or sin against me again. Can you count the times you've sinned against God? I can't. Christians forgive because we understand the forgiveness that we've received. This is a hard pill to swallow sometimes. But we understand forgiveness. That's why we extend forgiveness. We understand grace, which is why we understand, ex, extend grace and mercy. To not forgive is to show that you don't actually understand the forgiveness that you claim to have received. And I would argue that those who withhold forgiveness should question their own sanctification, or their own salvation, excuse me. In Matthew chapter 6, after teaching the Lord's Prayer, Jesus himself said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Sounds like a condition for salvation, but no, it's a result of salvation that we forgive. It's because we have received forgiveness that we freely give it out to others. How many times we forgive? One of the disciples asked that too, 70 times seven, which is an illustration or a way to describe all the times. We always forgive. Because those who received this undeserved forgiveness from the Lord could not imagine a time, could not imagine a time where they would withhold forgiveness of another. The last part of verse four here says, and lead us not into temptation. And there's something I think we need to clear up about this, that God doesn't tempt us. James chapter one, verse 13 to 14 says, God cannot be tempted by evil and he doesn't tempt anyone. It says that our temptations come from our own evil desires within. 
So if God isn't the one who's tempting us, then what does this verse mean? And I think this is a, a prayer of protection. That as we go about our way following the Lord's will and plan, that means submitting to his uh, decisions, right? That we would be protected from temptation. That we would be protected from falling into sin. And this is a prayer that I think we can take confidence in praying because God has made us promises. And I wanna, uh, want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we'll look at verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's a beautiful promise. That even when we're tempted, God promises that it won't be more than we can bear. And he always provides a way out. So what does that say about us when we sin? It means we chose not to take the way out that God provided. We are no longer slaves to sin. That means we have the ability to say no when tempted. And when I was reading through this and thinking through this, I thought about, you know when you're driving down the road and you're following your GPS? I get lost going everywhere, so I always have my GPS going. And you see some traffic coming up. What does your GPS do? Your GPS suggests another route to bypass the traffic. Anyways, anyone who's driven into California or going towards LA, you get down there and it's like, oh, would you like to go around LA? Because <laughs> traffic is just terrible going through there. It suggests another way, gives you another route. So now instead of the one path you had initially, the GPS has now given you two paths. The question becomes, which path do you take? Which route do you follow? Do you continue to walk toward the temptation or do you take the new route, the new way out that God has provided? Lead us not into temptation is praying that God would protect us as we're following him. We are following his directions and his directives and we're walking in his path and plans and we're praying that God will protect us along the way. We deal with enough temptation as it is, Lord. So I'm praying, please lead my path in a way that doesn't add to it and protect me when it comes. Does that make sense? You guys tracking with that? Okay, so just to recap these verses two through four, and it's gonna start speeding up really fast, so put on your seatbelt. But just to recap verses two through four, our loving Father who is holy and to be revered, we pray and ask that your rule and reign would come to earth that you would give us what we need for today and forgive our sins as we extend the same forgiveness to others and please protect us from the temptation to sin as we go about our day following you. It's a pretty quick summary of verses two through four. So we're gonna go through these next two parts pretty quick because they're illustrations to help Jesus make, that he's giving to help him make his point. And so he's gonna start by telling us the posture that we should take when we pray. He told us the kinds of things to pray for. Now he's gonna say the posture that we should take. Let's look at verses five through eight. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Life was different back then than it is now. Living conditions and traveling, uh, you, they didn't have cars. So when you, there wasn't a quick day trip somewhere and then drive back home in the same day. You would go somewhere. It would take a while to walk there, maybe ride on an animal, and then you'd stay there for a little while. And hospitality was a big deal for the Israelites. It wasn't just a big deal. God commanded it, right? So if a friend showed up in the middle of the night and you weren't ready for them, you might run to your neighbor's house banging on the door asking for three loaves of bread because they showed up and you weren't ready. But the living conditions were also different back then. Most of the houses were small and had one room. So there might be a big mat that you just lay out in the middle of the floor and the whole family sleeps on that mat at night. So it makes sense if your neighbor came banging on the door that you might send them away because you're literally, your whole family is literally asleep around you. You're like, stop banging on the door. You're going to wake up my wife and kids. Like, go away. Because we're all sleeping in the same area. But what does verse 8 say? Can we go back and look at verse 8? 
I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship. This is a friend here. He's like, go away, friend. I'm not giving you anything. Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Because of your shameless audacity. Those words can be understood as persistent boldness. Your persistent boldness. This guy just won't give up. If I don't get out of bed, he's going to wake up my whole family. So he finally will get out of bed. Because of your persistence, he will get up and give you as much as you need. And after giving this illustration, what conclusion does Jesus come to after he gives this illustration? What directive does he give? And we're going to look at the next two verses. This persistent boldness. He says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus says, be the persistent neighbor. When you're asking, be the persistent neighbor. Ask, seek, and knock. He just finished telling us the kinds of things we should be praying for, right? Verses two through four. But now he tells us how we should be asking. We should ask with persistence or persistently ask for these things. To boldly ask for these things with shameless audacity, we should ask for these things because those who ask will receive. Those who seek, they will find. And those who knock, the door will be opened. God answers his children. God answers his children. It's funny because Jesus is basically saying if you bother someone enough, they'll eventually get sick of hearing from you and they'll give you what you want. This is the example he's giving. How many times have you given into your kids because they wouldn't stop nagging you? Right? Fine. Yes. Whatever. Just leave me alone. You can have it. Get out of my face. Now, I don't think God responds like that, even though we do. But it's pretty much how Jesus is telling us how to pray, to have that kind of persistence with God the Father, to have that shameless audacity when praying to God. Because he's not like an earthly father. He doesn't say, fine, whatever, get out of my face. He's not like an earthly father. No, he's our perfect heavenly father. Look, look at the last three verses. What is Jesus talking about here? Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake and said? Or if he asks you for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Even an evil earthly father, when they're asked with shameless audacity by their children, will give good gifts. An evil there, if you look at the word, it actually means bad, of bad nature or condition. In an ethical sense, evil, wicked, and bad which is literally all of humanity. So even us bad-natured fathers will still give good gifts to our children when they ask. We know how to give good gifts. But how much more will God, who is pure and holy, our heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? God gives his children what they truly need. What's our greatest need? What is our greatest need over all things that we need? Someone's like, we need to breathe. No, we need a solution to our sin problem. Because if you bite the dust and that isn't taken care of, eternity's a long time. Our greatest problem, our greatest need is a solution for our sin problem. And God, is our, God the Holy Spirit is our seal. He's our guarantee that we are forgiven, that we, re that we will receive the promised eternal life. The Holy Spirit is also the source of all good things in our life, the source of everything we need. And I read a really good quote from John MacArthur this week that I want to read. It's kind of long. To those who ask for a gift, he gives the giver. To those who ask for an effect, he gives the cause. To those who ask for a product, he gives the source. To those seeking comfort, he gives the comforter. To those seeking power, he gives the source of power. To those seeking help, he gives the helper. To those seeking truth, he gives the spirit of truth. To those seeking love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, he gives the producer of all those things. The indwelling Holy Spirit is the source of every good thing in the Christian's life. That's awesome. 
God, the Holy Spirit, God himself is the source of every good thing in the life of a Christian. And verse 13 here is reminding us that God is a good father and he gives us what we need. He gives us the Holy Spirit when we ask him. Thank you, God, that you don't leave us spending for ourselves, trying to solve our own problem. Thank you for not leaving us in our need, but you are Jehovah Jireh and you provided for us. You meet our truest and deepest needs. Can I have the team come up? God answers his children. God provides. God provided the way for us to be forgiven of our sins, made a new creature, and received eternal life. He commands people everywhere to repent of their sin and to believe in Jesus. And for those that do, we receive the greatest gift of all, to be reconciled to the creator of all things and to be adopted into the family of God and called his child. So for those of us who have already been called out of darkness into light, who have moved from spiritual death to spiritual life, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, what do we do with today's text? What do we do with what we just learned from today? And I think the biggest encouragement I see from the text is to pray. We should pray that him, what peace we often forfeit, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. The source of all good things, the good father who always gives good gifts, who gives the Holy Spirit to those who ask. We can ask. We can actually have a conversation with him. We already read in Philippians 4, that we shouldn't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. We should bring everything to God. Bring it all to God. But it also says in Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And here's the kicker. Let us then, because of all this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We don't serve and follow a God who doesn't know what we're going through. He entered into humanity to literally walk in the shoes of mankind. He knows. And because of that, we can approach him with confidence and receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So if you're a believer, pray. Pray all the time about everything. Thank him for stuff. Ask him for stuff. I don't know, wrestle with things you don't understand in scripture with him. All the time. Just pray. Just pray. Pray without ceasing in constant communication and fellowship with God. But I do have a question. What about when God says no? What about when he says no? We're more specific to today's text because they were asking for stuff and God gave them the Holy Spirit. What about when he answers your prayer in a way you didn't expect or with something you weren't asking for. You asked for one thing and he gave you another. What do you do then? Praise be to God. Do you trust his answer? We've all prayed to God and asked for things we didn't get. We might have prayed, God, please let me get that promotion. Please help me find a new job. Please help me find a spouse. Please heal my sickness. Still sniffling. Please help my brother out of his addiction. Please heal my family member's cancer. Please save my dad. Please save my children. 
I pray that every night. But what happens when God answers our prayers in a way we didn't expect or weren't hoping for? What if he straight up says no? Do you trust his answer? Think about your toddler begging you to eat an entire bag of cotton candy from the fair. I did that and threw up in a movie store. It was terrible. What's your answer? No, you can't eat the whole bag of cotton candy. That's the obvious answer, right? No, you can't eat the whole thing. Maybe you can eat some of it. Or how about we eat some real food first, some real dinner food, and then you can have some after dinner. But why do you say no? Why don't you give them exactly what they're asking for? Why don't you give them the answer they want? It's because you know better. You know better than what they're asking for. You know it's not good for them to eat the whole bag that they're probably gonna throw up in a movie store. Do you not think that God knows what's best? Do you not think that God knows what he's doing? And I'm not just talking about what's best for us. I mean, what's best for his plans. You know that God is here and he's trying to accomplish something on earth, right? God has a plan that he's trying to accomplish. Not trying, he's going to accomplish it. He has a plan that he's working out and you and I, not the center of it. As valuable and loved by God as we are because he knows the hairs on your head, right? Before the foundations of the world, he knitted you together in your mother's womb, prepared good works for you to do in advance. We're valuable to God. And as valuable and as loved as we are by God, we are not the center. He is the center. He is the center of everything. That means saying yes to every single one of our prayer requests or answering our prayers in exactly the way we want might not be in his plans for what he is accomplishing. But I don't want you to feel alone when it comes to God not answering the prayers you want in the way you want them to be answered. Because there's actually two people that we need to remember that God said no to. Paul asked God more than once to remove the thorn in his flesh. And God told him no. He said, my power is made perfect in weakness. So God left that thorn in Paul's flesh in his side so that he would rely on the strength of God rather than on his own to do the job that God called him to do. So God says no to Paul. But God also said no to Jesus. Think about when Jesus was praying in the garden before he was crucified. He said, if it's your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Well, Jesus was still crucified, which means God said no to that prayer request. The cup did not pass from Jesus. So if God tells you no to your, to your prayer requests, or if your answers them in a different way than you expected, you're among good company. Paul and Jesus. But we need to remember a very, very important promise from God. Scripture tells us that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God not only ordains the end of things, but he also ordains the means to that end. And all of it culminates in ultimate good for us. How? I don't know. But I believe him when he says it. So do I trust him on the journey? Do I trust that his answer is best? Do I trust that he knows what he's doing? Do I accept and submit to the answer he gives me? He's my father. Do I accept the answer? Do I submit to it? Do I believe that when I pray for his kingdom to come and his will to be done, that it's for my good? Do I believe that? Can we put the big idea back on the screen? God gives his children what they truly need. So pray persistently and boldly. It's all about trust though. Do you trust him? 
Do you trust that what he's giving you is truly what you need? That he said, no, you can't eat the whole bag of cotton candy. It's a stupid example, but it makes sense. When God says, no, you can't have the whole bag of cotton candy. Do you trust that that's what you truly need? Trust. As children of God, we come to the Father when we need something. We come to God, our Father, like our children come to us with persistence, boldness, and shameless audacity. You should never be ashamed to ask God for anything. He just might tell you no. And it's a good thing that he tells you no. But with boldness and persistence, we go to God. He answers our prayers with what we truly need. As high as the, heaven, uh, as the heavens are higher than the earth, God's ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. He knows what's best and he knows what's better. So when he answers us, we submit to him and trust his answer is good. Amen? Can you guys stand to your feet, please?